share my little, there we go. Okay, so we are, our recording has started. Great. And I think I just shared just my presentation screen. Tell me if I'm wrong. Um, I, I, we can see all of the windows. Go away windows. <laughs> Hang on a sec. <laughs> but none of them are. were bad, so that's right. okay. <laughs> Now we can see your calendar. Really? Yep. How did I do that? Hang on. I'm, I swear I'm not as not tech savvy as I seem in this moment. I have some skills. <laughs> Better. Good. All right. There we go. So I should, I'll just go ahead, right? It's time to start. Great. So, um, Hi, everybody. I'm Monica McAvoy. I think I recognize most folks here uh, today, but, um, but I'm excited to share this conversation with you talking about in intergroup dialogue as inclusive pedagogy. Um, it's not a workshop on dialogue. We're not going to do dialogue, do a dialogue, but um, we are kind of growing some efforts. Um, I got some Shinneman funding this year uh, to do some work with UP, and now we're about to begin some work with faculty and staff. Um, I'll talk more about that in a, in a bit um, and go ahead and get started and tell you what we're gonna be up to today. Um, we'll just do some basic introductions. I'm curious about what's bringing folks into this uh, workshop. Um, we'll talk about some community guidelines, uh, check in on nonviolent communication and empathy, which are things that we in the Institute or in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion prior, we're starting to do some work with um, that kind of inform thinking about intergroup dialogue. We'll just share a definition. We'll talk about kind of the stages and, and how the structure works, um, using it for tough conversations. What do we mean when we're talking about it as inclusive pedagogy? I have a couple scenarios that I think I'll put y'all into breakout rooms or some kind of rooms to um, work through uh, and just think about what, what could I do this, do with this in a, if I was using a dialogic approach, right? So, um, so again, I'm Monica McAvoy. I'm in the Institute for Equity, Diversity, Inclusion and Transformative Practice. Uh, and also I work in Title IX with Lisa Evaneski. Um, I think when I first came to work in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion and talked to Rodman, I said, what do I, what should I be thinking about? And he said, you should go read Marshall Rosenberg. And uh, my grad program was a teacher prep program for TESOL, um, but we did do a lot of work with nonviolent communication. And I had read Marshall Rosenberg and uh, it was nice to kind of revisit through a different lens. Um, but we really talked a lot about what possibility this might have for campus, like, um, for students not just to share their experiences, but for students to listen to each other's experiences and maybe think about them in, uh, in the context of some larger issues we might be thinking about together and uh, to move forward and, and take action together, right? Um, so I'm curious what folks here in the room, why you're here today, what you're thinking about. When I go for professional development, I usually have a question I'm trying to answer. So I'm curious to hear what folks' questions are. So if I, if I go down my screen, I think at the top, um, I see Brandon, is it over in 215? Should I just start there and then we'll move through our remote room? Hi, can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Hi, so um, my name is Brandon Bennett. I'm the uh, brand new director of student conduct for the Office of the Dean of Students. Um, and uh, this is my fourth week here. So um, I'm coming from the University of Rochester where I was also working in student conduct. Um, while I was there, um, did a lot of work incorporating um, restorative practices into um, the student conduct process. And so that is work that I really enjoy and like to do. Um, on a personal level, I really enjoy being in restorative spaces and being part of those conversations. And so, um, so I think my big question is, you know, now here, how do I um, incorporate more restorative work into the student conduct process? Um, and who are my allies in doing that? 
um, and getting that work done, so. Great, thanks. I really appreciate hearing that. Um, Kristen, you're next in my window. I think Maggie's next. Oh, I can. Oh, Maggie, I'm sorry. Oh, well, Maggie. Okay. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I'm Maggie Schmuel. I am an uh, assistant professor of criminal justice, and I currently serve as the associate director of CELT, um, which is the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching, which is uh, putting on all of these workshops this week. Um, so what brings me to this workshop, um, you know, we, in my criminal justice courses, we um, often um, engage in very difficult conversations and, um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about um, how to make our conversations productive and respectful for one another. And so I'm excited to participate in this workshop to see how I can improve those practices um, and, you know, what everyone else's experiences are with um, you know, using intergroup dialogue in their uh, teaching and um, or whatever workspaces that they are using. So thank you so much for um, for putting this together. And also, I'd like to say I'm a big fan of restorative practices. <laughs> so I'm excited to hear about your work, Brandon. Um, thank you so much, Maggie. And I didn't mean to omit you. I've just been thinking of you as the mistress of ceremonies. So I know that is also a role I play. <laughs> Okay, now Kristen, you're next. Okay, so um, I don't, I don't want to sound creepy, but any, I, anything, anything Annika does, I try and go to. <laughs> you all know what I mean, you know. There's good stuff, it's just good stuff. Um, plus, I was um, educated and raised in predominantly white areas, and although our, I spent um, 17 years on a Hispanic serving uh, serving institution campus, um, that was. I think some of you know, 90% Mexican American campus. That type of um, racial and ethnic dialogue is in some ways just as restrictive as it is being on a predominantly white campus because the conversation always focuses in one direction. So I, I'm, I'm in a lifelong journey to become more comfortable, more comfortable, more comfortable saying things out loud. And knowing when to step forward and when to step back. Thanks, Kristen. I appreciate that, and and mirror echo that as well. Um, Jackie, you're next in my window. <laughs> so I want to give a shout out to uh, Brandon. Welcome to SUNY Oswego. <laughs> and uh, I got to play the role of interim over in conduct a, a couple of years ago before the other director too. So I highly value and respect the work that you do. Welcome aboard. Um, and my role in career services uh, currently is the uh, career coach for education, public and human services, uh, but I also work very closely uh, with our internship programs and teach uh, an exploratory course uh, for uh, undeclared students. So I'm often jumping into these conversations for uh, within a number of lenses. Um, I actually just picked up after participating in a couple um, NACE webinars. Uh, one book is Inclusive Supervision in Student Affairs, but also Identity Conscious Supervision in Student Affairs. So any conversation I can have to uh, engage others, learn more, um, listen more, uh, I like to jump in uh, both, uh, I jump into Annika's, but also Chris and your uh, presentations as well, I also find very valuable and always have takeaways, so thank you. Um, so yeah, I just look forward to the conversation and um, continually growing and developing spaces where, especially in the courses and the workshops and stuff that we do, that we are creating a space where people feel included and welcome and that um, what we're providing is equitable and inclusive to all students too. So lots of work to be done. Thanks so much, Jackie. Um, Michael, you're next in the window. <laughs> Thanks, Annika. Hi, everyone. My name is Michael Chanis and I, um, I work in the Department of uh, Anthropology and uh, in Native American Studies. I just finished my third year at SUNY Oswego and I'm a visiting assistant professor. I guess I'm also the director of Native American Studies here. Um, and I, I work with, uh, you know, students and I, and I work with, um, you know, contemporary Native people, I, I think who are, what we've been referring to, who often feel on, on the outside, uh, who also often feel on the periphery, um, even of conversations about intergroup dialogue. And so like Kristen, I, I try to do my best to, to stay um, up to date on the things that are happening on campus, 
that are geared towards um, centering some of those voices on the periphery. Thanks so much. Um, Kristen, you're next. Hi there, I'm Chris Munger and I'm from the School of Education. I'm the Associate Dean. And it's like, this is one of those times where I wanna say that you took my answers. Like a lot of the things that bring me here to this space are similar to what other people are talking about. The only thing um, that I might be able to add is back in the day when I lived in Ithaca, New York and NBC, um, nonviolent communication was um, a big part of practices within the community and there were different trainings and um, I had an early interest in learning more about it and kept at it for a while and then um, upon I guess my career and moving and things like that that I lost touch with a lot of the techniques of NBC and I'm very, I've redeveloped some of the interests so I'm really interested in how that you know wrapping what I knew before, what I'm learning now, and what I can learn from other people within a new context. Mm -hmm. um, I'm really interested in that. So it's great to have just the notion of restorative practices and the intersection of, of all the previous knowledge, new knowledge, and then a new con context with lots of knowledgeable and interested people. Great. Thanks, Kristen. Uh, Murat. Hello, Ron. I'm Murat Yashar, one of the associate deans in class and a history professor. Um, I'm here because uh, I teach Middle East history, and I was wondering if I could use this tool in my uh, some of my discussions in the classes. Also, I'm curious where intergroup dialogue and how could be used on our campus. I was a part of the uh, deliberative dialogue group from our campus, so I, I'm also curious about how they are similar and different as well. Uh, in that regard. Thank you. Thank you. It, it's funny, Mara, as I was preparing this, like I don't really reference uh, the deliberative dialogues training, which I would participated in too, except I was talking to, and I'll talk about this a little later, I was talking to Pete Wilner at Interfaith Works, who we've been working with locally, and he started talking about wicked problems. And do you remember that phrase from that training? And I was like, oh, it's a universal phrase, wicked problems. I just thought someone was from Boston. <laughs> Renee, you're next in the window. <laughs> I'm sorry for being late. I'm not sure what we're talking about as far as what I'm introducing. Oh, just what brings you to this conversation? What, what questions are you trying to answer? Gotcha. Um, my name is Renee Landis Jennings. I'm a senior associate in residence life and housing. And um, I've had a couple of different trainings uh, in CBI and I did the social justice training typically used for conduct. And so I know it's a big thing in Syracuse, um, the social justice and those conversations. And then within our department, we started reading the fierce conversations last year and having those difficult conversations, um, be it with our peers or with students. And we even did it with the RAs. And so um, the more information, the better in order to people to have a viable conversation versus a difficult conversation. The more that we can help others understand what we're trying to get at um, and the impact that they have, what they bring to those conversation can help alleviate some of the frustration and the stress and the agita that we find ourselves in if they understand if we all are on the same level. Great. Thank you. I love that viable conversations piece. That's helpful. Um, Michelle Bishop. Hi. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I'm just going to opt not to be on camera today, um, but I am here to learn as much as I can. And I think like Mike and Jackie said, um, a lot of what they said, I also share in that. And I just feel that we all need to be able to have these tools to have real conversations. So thanks. Thanks so much. And uh, so I think we that we heard from everybody in the room with us. Um, so, um, oh, I also wanna add Kendra wanted to be with us today but she was summoned at the last minute to a college council meeting. Um, so I wonder what's more fun. <laughs> 
but um, so one of the things I think it's important to start out with are kind of community guidelines or community agreements for conversation. Um, and this is something that in dialogue you would likely work out with participants. Um, I just kind of share, I'm sharing some examples here, largely, you know, so we can come to these agreements, but also just to model um, that, that, that kind of intentionality. And I think if we're thinking about intergroup dialogue, there are a couple of ways that I think about it. And one is that we plan a dialogue, right? There's something that we want to talk about. We provide some resources to get folks grounded in the topic. And then we come together and folks are able to share their experiences and feelings in a, in a brave and safe space, right? Another time might be that something just comes up and you need to pivot the conversation in a way that, that kind of mirrors all those qualities. Um, but perhaps you have not been planning it for weeks. Perhaps something just came up an hour ago or was on the news last night that you need to talk about in class or in your space. Um, and I think kind of having some of these intentional practices in place can really can help with pre-planning something, but also can help with a quick pivot if that's what, what you're needing. Um, <laughs> thanks, Michelle. I just looked at the, the chat comments. <laughs> um, uh, and then a third thing is uh, that I think about, and you know, I'm not teaching a class right now, but the idea that a class itself across a semester is a series of dialogues. And, and you know, again, having these intentional practices or strategies kind of coming into a semester so that when there are opportunities to engage in this way, your students' skills have been growing and your students are grounded in, we, it's not a surprise. It's not, oh, we're gonna deal with this tough topic and I don't know what to do with it. So um, some community guidelines might be that we're gonna, we're gonna keep this conversation confidential. Um, our commitment here is to learn from each other. Uh, we won't demean or devalue people for their experiences or their lack of experiences or their interpretations of their experiences. Um, we will trust that people are always doing the best they can. And I love this one. This is like a, a How Howard Gordon golden nugget. Um, this is the way he talked about approaching folks. Um, speak from your lived experience, um, speak your discomfort. And, and these two are interesting for me because I feel like in my work, you know, I'm often trying to center experiences that aren't mine and give voice to, to things that um, aren't my experiences. And I feel vulnerable in that space. So sometimes I'm kind of going back and forth between, I need to share that this is an experience. I also need to share, you know, kind of my discomfort with talking about something that's not my own. Um, expect and accept a lack of closure. Um, that's a good one. Uh, I struggle with that as a parent, actually. <laughs> um, and active listening, one mic is one we talk about a lot. Um, so I don't know if this is a pretty exhaustive list. I'm, I'm sorry we didn't work it out together, but is there anything anyone wants to add or kind of a go-to for you when you're working with groups or? Um, one thing that I always add is that um, I ask students to address each other by name. Um, so that way, you know, they're like humanizing each other and that they're, um, you know, engaging with each other um, on a, um, you know, not um, just kind of like that person said this, right? But they're, they're being direct and, um, you know, giving, um, you know, each other that kind of respect. That's great. I appreciate that. Any other thoughts or? Okay. So, so here we have our guidelines. I'm going to scoot along. Um, sorry, it's Brene Brown. I probably could find somebody <laughs> more academic or, <laughs> um, but uh, Chris Munger, I have to tell you, I've been thinking about empathy. Uh, and I remember during the pandemic, we, you were in a, a workshop or a conversation that I think was about nonviolent communication. And we ended up really talking about a need for empathy in, in that kind of space, like in that effort. Um, 
so uh, so I've literally, you know, in the year and a half or so since been reading about empathy and thinking about empathy, trying to figure out how can we explore it as a campus, like what would that look like? Um, but this idea that it's not connecting to an experience, it's not I walked in your shoes, it's I understand your feelings, or I can relate to your feelings, or I can make space for your feelings. And I think another important piece is actually from our community agreements, this idea of not being attached to an outcome when we're offering empathy, right? Um, so something important to keep in mind, I think, as we're working with students uh, and, and thinking about um, intergroup dialogue, but also in thinking about nonviolent communication. Um, so I was so pleased. I think, Chris, you brought it up and Renee, you brought it up. Um, but this kind of basic toolkit for how to, and this is something that, you, so when I talk about my grad program uh, using Marshall Rosenberg or exposing us to teaching us about, it was really, we were often talking about observing teaching, you know, and being objective in what we saw and also kind of, and it, Jackie, you just were talking about supervision as well, right? So being objective instead of judgmental, um, kind of talking about what you're feeling or observing among students, figuring out what needs to be happening, making a request instead of telling somebody to go do something. Um, and again, I think that this uh, kind of, these stages are reflected in inter intergroup dialogue. So I just wanted to kind of review that quickly and kind of bring it up before we, we barreled on through. Anyone have any thoughts there? Um, it just made me think of parenthood too, of <laughs> making requests, not go do this kind of a thing too, and, and treat you know your children and stuff like that as people, and keeping that in check and feeling their feelings and, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's complete. My my kids laugh at my list where I'll in like a minute be like, unload the dishwasher, brush your teeth, take a bath, do your homework. You know, I just let it all out there. Really, none of it's a request. Um, also with empathy, I was actually talking to, um, I read a book called um, The Art of Holding Space this year and was talking to the author, and I'm only remembering her name right now, Jennifer, I don't remember her last, Jennifer Platt, Heather Platt, there we go. My cousins are Jennifer and Heather, that's the source of that confusion. But, um, and I was sharing with her that my, my son was feeling depressed in January and I was reading the book at the same time. And my inclination is to say, when I was your age, up, 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 and really trying to remove myself from that and just listen, you know, not project my experience onto him. And, and her comment was, it's really difficult with your family because you are invested in the outcome. You know, if you say, you know, let go of the outcome or solving the problems, it's really hard to do that with your, with your own family. So, um, so this is, you know, like a, a Wikipedia definition, intergroup dialogue, face-to-face -face facilitated conversation between members of two or more social identity groups that strives to create new levels of understanding, relating, and action. The process promotes conversation around controversial issues in order to generate new collective visions that uphold uh, the dignity of all people. Um, so it's a process of collaborative understanding, does not demand or expect agreement, listening deeply enough to be changed. And I think even in this definition, you can see where um, points of uh, empathy and nonviolent communication are reflected. Um, but there you go, face-to-face -face facilitated conversation. Um, within that though, there are some things to think about, you know, when we think about conversations, uh, one is this idea, and especially I think as, as um, teachers, right? Monologue, one voice, multiple participants, one voice maintains the silence of others. I feel like I'm doing a little bit right now, uh, but not with a win-lose orientation and I'm not disregarding our relationships, okay? <laughs> um, a discussion has multiple voices, multiple participants. Each will try to persuade the others though, right? Um, win-lose orientation, but you're still retaining your relationships. Debate, um, uh, I remember being in debate club in high school, multiple voices, multiple participants, each voice tries to overcome the others, win-lose orientation, disregards relationships. Um, I used to love debate club because I felt like it gave you license to be a jerk, to be honest. It was this kind of like know-it-all stance 
of I'm sharing my information. Uh, there was something in it. You know, it, it speaks to a different chord, I think, but um, Kristen just recoiled. <laughs> Uh, but I think as a high school student with very little power to kind of get up as a no, know it all, there was, there was something about it. Um, I think that might, I don't know. Um, but now I like dialogue, multiple voices, multiple participants, each voice tries to create mutual understanding. It's not about winning or losing. It's about building relationships. Even if at the end of it, you still don't agree with each other, you built this relationship and maybe can come to some common action out of that. Um, the, there are four stages in the model. Um, so the first is really to create a shared meaning of dialogue, creating an environment for dialogue. Um, this is where your group formation and trust building are gonna happen. Uh, this is where you're gonna build understanding about what dialogue is, but also what it is not. Um, in stage two, you are gonna dig a little bit deeper with identity, social relations, conflict, situating the dialogue learning about commonalities and differences of experiences. This might be where you explore privilege. This might be where um, you start to explore some social justice issues. Um, but in stage three is where you're gonna really dig deep, you know, hot topics. Uh, we're gonna talk about conflicts of perspective, multiple perspectives. This is a place to explore um, those wicked problems, right? That um, So when Murad talked about the deliberative dialogue training, the uh, topic that we're really focused on, and I actually ended up doing it with students and it, it was interesting to do was this idea of how do we have free speech on an inclusive campus? Um, it's something, you know, I'm on the flags committee. We're talking about flags of meaning. It's something we explore in that space. Students uh, want to be able to say what they can want to say. And, you know, there's a kind of accountability they can't be held to. We talk about it in bias prevention and response. Um, and there is not a clear answer to that question. How do we protect free speech on an inclusive campus? But at the very least, you can invite folks into a space to consider that, right? What does free speech mean? What are your personal experiences with some of the kinds of speech that don't cross over into constitutionally hate speech, but that have a negative impact, right? Um, or what's empowering for one person and not for another? So um, I don't know, Murad, I know we did a, a dialogue exercise in your class. I did this topic with Laker leaders um, because they really were saying, this is the question students are asking us when they, this is one of the things they wanna know about. Um, and I think while we weren't able to come to a clear conclusion, um, they were able to spend enough time with the topic and considering different perspectives that I think they, what they expressed to us was feeling more confident in dealing with that topic when talking to students. So, um, so, uh, so digging deep in stage three and then in stage four is an opportunity to build alliances and maybe think about um, next steps. Um, and again, even if we don't agree, how can we be in community together uh, and move forward? So, so those are the stages. Um, and I know I've got participants here who might have different degrees of experience. Um, does anyone have any questions or thoughts here or? All right, I'm gonna move along and talk about um, some considerations and then um, kind of competencies and maybe some thinking about curriculum. Um, so dialogue groups are co-led by trained facilitators who belong to the participating social identity groups, ideally. So if you're having a, a cross-race dialogue, you would have a white student or a white facilitator and a student of color or a facilitator of color leading the conversation or representing the, the affinity or identity groups. Um, in talking about uh, competency development um, for facilitators, but I think even for, I think even participants will kind of build in these competencies. And the first thing is knowledge and awareness of your own social identity, and then growing your understanding of others' social identities um, and, and histories and experiences. Uh, also small group leadership skills, um, including the ability to lead difficult conversations, uh, constructively explore conflicting needs, 
or hot issues. Um, I think another piece to keep in mind here is, is just reading the group. Um, again, I was talking to Pete Wilner at Interfaith Works. Um, and, you know, A, we were talking about the work with UP, um, but he was also just talking about different groups he's worked with. They've worked with Syracuse University, um, different groups within the community, Syracuse Police Department, um, Onondaga Community College, but also recognizing that sometimes your group might really not be able to engage. Um, there might be other, sometimes they might need you to instruct a little bit to kind of move them through the information. Sometimes they might need alternative ways to connect with you and share their thoughts and experiences. Um, he talked about one group where there was, um, there was one woman in the group and nobody shared, but then the woman wrote him later uh, in a way that helped him understand that there was a power dynamic at play and kind of a, a safety concern where she just didn't want to be the person engaging when, you know, the seven men in the group were not. Um, so, so just being aware of some of those dynamics and figuring out ways to, to work with the folks participating. Um, in terms of curricular development, uh, and again, I kind of uh, alluded to different scenarios where, where dialogic experiences might be helpful. One is a really planned dialogue. Like, you know what, we all need to get together and talk about this thing. Um, and then you're really gonna wanna be thinking about uh, maybe some materials to help folks get grounded with the topic um, and maybe be prepared with discussion questions or even transition questions, which is something that, that I like to do really for anything where other people are, are, are gonna be talking in a, in a way where I wanna guide them through, be it a panel discussion or a discussion. Uh, when we as a staff have done anything dialogue, I guess something I've worked with like Markel and Tiffany on, like, you know, here are some questions in case you need to scoot it along or what questions do you think are gonna help us transition to the next part of the conversation. Um, learning objectives, good, you know, why, what, what outcome, we're not attached to the outcomes in terms of changing everybody's mind necessarily, but there are learning objectives. There are things that we want folks to explore together. What types of uh, teaching or experiential activities can you share to help folks think about a thing together, right? Um, one of the things we use uh, when we're talking about uh, either bias or intersectional intersectionality is a, this walk through the park activity where somebody closes their eyes and you walk them through the park and they see all these different individuals, but none of their identities are shared, just that it's it, it beyond, you know, you see two men, you see a child playing catch with people, and, and then you ask folks to fill in the blanks, you know, who did you actually see? And, and then we talk about, you know, what the implications are for how they fill in the world, right? Um, so essays might be helpful. I know a few years ago, we were doing some dialogue stuff with, uh, with Sean uh, Chrysler and Kate wolf -Liga, and they always brought a lot of great materials in to get, help get students thinking about the topics. So um, just thinking in your planning, you know, a shared understanding of why, what are our learning objectives? Um, and sometimes some of these activities or materials can also offer a, a third point of entry, right? And again, this is something I used to think about in student teacher supervision, right? You know, it's me talking to a mentor and a candidate and I don't want the mentor and candidate to be totally focused on each other. I really want them to be looking at what's happening with students. And that's gonna move the conversation about what each is doing while in the classroom together. This focus on this third point, the students. Just like when I'm teaching something with students and I want them to synthesize it, uh, I don't wanna just be standing up in front of them and telling them, I wanna give them a third, something else to engage with to kind of explore their understanding, right? So something else to think about with developing curriculum for uh, dialogue. I'm actually doing okay for time. I think I've got three more slides. I'm feeling pretty proud. I'm gonna keep going. Any questions right now? Anything anyone wants to share? <laughs> All right, I'm gonna scooch over to, um, so I think there are areas in which folks will grow in this process. So sustained communication, um, a lot of good stuff will come out of having communication over time, right? Um, critical social awareness, not just because you're giving folks an article to read or a video to watch or an activity to do, but because of the conversation they're having with people who have different experiences, identities, and backgrounds. 
Um, and then bridge building, you know, by kind of creating this space where folks can feel brave and open up, um, we can help to build connections among people who might not get to know each other. You know, I remember the first class I took where the teacher put the desks in a circle. Of course, it was an English teacher, right? Um, but I still remember things, I was thinking about this the other day, I still remember things people said in that class and that model. And if I think about the year before, I only remember the teacher, maybe because he was hilarious, but, but I don't remember a lot of what other students were saying about the things that we were reading. But in that circle, we were our own community. We were, you know, the teacher really was kind of guiding us and facilitating conversation and he wasn't helping us come to any clear conclusions. So we were stuck with each other. We had to get to know each other. So. I know there's a lot of text here, but um, in terms of sustained communication, uh, time is really the thing, right? You know, and and even when we do workshops here out of the institute or the office, you know, often I'm not coming into a room with a concept that nobody's ever heard of. You know, we've heard all heard of implicit bias at this moment uh, in history, um, but I am creating space for us to think about it, maybe look at a de definition, do an activity, and then consider our own experiences. So I think the sustained communication piece is really about um, creating time and making it safe for folks to ask questions. Uh, a part of that might be kind of even leading up, if we're doing this in a class, leading up to this type of activity by modeling different kinds of um, uh, here are sensitive intercultural interaction, but but again, kind of safe and brave ways for folks to share experiences or have conversations. So fishbowls, I'm a huge fan of fishbowls. I love observing them. I don't know if I actually love being in the middle of them that much, but I do <laughs> um, love, love them. Circle of voices where you can hear different perspectives and identities. Uh, and again, even at the beginning of this workshop, as everybody shared their background, I'm always reminded that some one or two or three always say something I wasn't thinking about. You know, maybe I thought about it four months ago and you just reminded me, or maybe it's never even occurred to me, but kind of creating these spaces where students can really, or participants can really hear each other and, and be thinking about that. Have I ever thought about this before? Or wow, I've never heard that. Um, and I think these spaces are really good for that. Um, this is a good, uh, in this space, you want to be trauma sensitive. Um, one question might be that you kind of share uh, an article or a story or a video connected to a topic that you want to explore. Um, and then you ask, what about this feels familiar or surprising to you? So not what happened to you, not tell us about yourself even necessarily, but kind of inviting folks to connect to their emotions and the thing that you're trying to explore. And that might bring up personal experience, but, but it's a little more roundabout. Another thing that I got out of a Title IX training um, was this question, help me understand, right? So instead of, uh, you know, tell me more, or why did you say this instead of that, just help me understand and like kind of open it up for someone to paint a picture for you. Um, so this is a great opportunity to, to grow in our ability to communicate through this sustained kind of communication. Um, it's a great opportunity to grow in critical social awareness, um, which um, I think of as kind of getting to the why, right? Like recognizing, there's a little example here about, actually, Renee, I think this is super housing relevant, right? Um, a conversation about segregation on campus uh, or self-segregation and, and, and white students might say, we think people of color stay together because they want to stay together. And then students of color might be like, we think that you're segregating this, like you're in your fraternities and your sororities and your activities and, and we're not included in them. You have segregated yourselves off, right? So, so if that's the feeling and the observation, what's the why? Like, what are the structures behind that? And now we're in a space together and we can kind of look at things um, piece by piece. You know, if we're talking about income inequality, you might have uh, one student say, you know, well, my dad's got an MBA and he works really hard at his company. He's working all the time. And I mean, he makes a lot of money, but he works all the time. And another participant might say, well, my mom works all the time, but she's working two jobs and they're minimum wage and she's exhausted, but is she working less hard? You know, so you can um, kind of look at these issues and then with 
by sharing experiences, start to look at what are the structures of what's the why? Why is it like this? And, and explore that together. Um, so, so out of that comes this opportunity for bridge building. Um, so, which is really just the now what? Um, you know, a, a real dialogue series is it could take like 12 hours, it could be across a semester. You could really explore a topic for a semester. Um, so then you have kind of looked at all these different nuances, angles, dimensions of an issue, experiences, perspectives, and then what's the next step? You know, one of the things that I noted in working with um, El Hindi Center for Dialogue at Interfaith Works is they've, ac they've actually changed their name. They are now the El Hindi Center for Dialogue and Action, because if we're gonna do all this talking, uh, what are the next steps? Um, and it might just be an invitation to continue to learn more. It might be an actual activity or outcome or, or kind of a sharing out of this understanding. Um, you know, there are a lot of possibilities, but, um, but I wanted to tease these pieces out. And we only have nine minutes, uh, but I'm gonna try to do this next piece in about five. <laughs> which is, um, so I have these three scenarios, they're kind of similar, but they're kind of different. And I, my hope is to just throw, throw us all into some breakout rooms. Uh, actually, Brandon and Maggie, I could just give you one of the scenarios, perhaps. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and read your scenario and uh, think about what would you hope to do in this situation? What might steps might you take through like a dialogic lens? What fears would you have? What questions do you have? So I'm going to turn to the scenarios now and just kind of review what they are and give us a couple minutes uh, in, I'll make two breakout rooms and then we'll have Maggie and Brandon. So our rooms will be a little big, but. Um, Allison here. Well, Allison, yay. So it's a nice round three. <laughs> so, so again, these seem related to me, but a little bit different. Um, some obviously, some less so perhaps, but you're leading a class discussing real estate market value versus assessment and want to explore systemic racism and the devaluation of housing in black neighborhoods, right? So very academic example, right? Um, you're leading a class discussing real estate market value versus assessment during the conversation. A student describes a derelict building using ghetto as an adjective. So that might be a pivot moment, right? Um, you're leading a class when a student brings up the mass shooting in Buffalo which again, I think could be real, related to uh, real estate and neighborhoods and systemic rate. I'm gonna stop talking though, because I'm ruining the scenarios. Um, so if everyone's comfortable, any questions about the scenarios? Did you want us to do uh, one particular scenario? Yep, so in a minute. So Maggie, I think I'll just give you all um, number one. Okay. And then these are the things to think about what would you hope to do? What steps might you take? What fears would you have? What questions do you have? This feels impossible to do in the now seven minutes we have left, but I'm gonna I'm gonna give it a shot. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. All right. Or should we just focus on one and do it all together? Maybe we should do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for saving me from myself. <laughs> uh, do you all want to vote in the chat on which of these seems most relevant at the moment to kind of consider together? One, two, or three? Just take a sec and look. You can just tell me privately if you want to anonym anonymously vote or just throw it in there for everybody. Okay, is there handouts? No, I just put them on the screen. Oh, I can't, oh, okay. I'm on a different oh no, computer. I'm sorry. That's okay, no problem. I'll just listen to this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can I vote? Yeah. Annika, I would be yeah. interested in doing number two because I can, you know, I, I've had just situations when students say things like that and don't really know how to approach it. Yeah. Um, well, I've got two votes for three. Oh, Kristen Coyle love debate. Oh my goodness, I'm just seeing that. She's still here. Um, hey, uh, Allison, why don't we do, just because a couple of folks wrote three in and it's pressing, but if you want to talk about nonviolent communication and, and slurs in the classroom, that's something we can, and responding to microaggressions, I'm happy to support you there. 
Sure, thanks. Okay. All right, so Buffalo. <laughs> uh, so I think we probably are all aware that there was a mass shooting at the Topps Market in Buffalo. The shooter um, had uh, planned for months the shooting, had gone into the market to kind of scope it out, um, specifically tar targeting people of color. Um, I'm unsure, actually, you've, I'm unsure the, I think nine people died. Is it nine? It is nine. Yeah. Um, and others were injured. So going to our question. So, because this, I think if we were in session right now, this would absolutely be a conversation that would be coming up in, in classes. And, and if not coming up something, perhaps you would even want to spend some time on in classes. Um, so, so what do you think? Like what steps might you take to talk about um, the mass shooting in Buffalo? Uh, this is Michelle. Mm -hmm. I definitely would want to acknowledge it. Um, I attended a faculty event recently and there was no mention of it. And I, I had, I thought about that for a bit afterwards. So just acknowledging that it's happened is really important. I believe. I agree. Thanks for that. I think, um, you know, for that first point, what I would hope to do, um, you know, not this, you know, specific incident, but other mass shootings and other racialized violence has come up in my classes before. And, you know, I, I, I tend to you know, bring it up to my students and say that I wanna create a space for us to talk about this. And you know, that is something that they you know, want to engage in. And if it's something that they're not ready to engage in, um, you know, that they um, you know, don't have to, or they can participate in any way that they, they see fit. Um, and so I think that's, at least when I go into those conversations, I you know, mostly am just thinking about creating that space and kind of letting it evolve organically um, and, you know, figure out what it is students need from that space and, um, you know, how to, you know, keep that conversation productive and uh, helpful for everyone. I also think about, do we create that space for our colleagues and peers as well that, you know, we have staff meetings, you know, or department meetings and stuff too. Are we holding space for that? And I think with that group, you tend to um, have worked and collaborated maybe in, in different ways throughout, you know, a period of time. So you may have created, um, you know, either comfortability or not, maybe with, you know, folks that you work with to set the stage and if you haven't already set those expectations to maybe we'll talk about it, talk about how it impacts and our reactions personally, but also, you know, thinking about how our interactions with students and whether they're interns or in their classes, you know, how it may impact them and how we can support as well. And then continuing that conversation too with um, the students that we work with. Yeah, and it, it feels like something again, where it's a, it's a pivot when these things happen, but what is the, what's the foundation that's already there? How are you building the foundation now for folks to feel safe and heard? I think two things come to mind when 9-11 happened and what we did for, you know, running around the campus, trying to make sure that everybody was taken care of, but nobody asked the faculty and staff who was working how this was impacting us. I'm from Manhattan. Nobody asked me, how is your family? What's going on with you? I was doing my job. At the same time, I can reach my family. Yeah. And so that brought that up later, but no one ever thought about the others impacted. Yeah. You know, we thought about the students, which is our number one priority, but we also have others. Then the second thing that came to mind was when Virginia Tech happened, I was teaching here. And even though it was Virginia Tech, we all thought about what if it happened here? Yeah. What will we do if we're teaching in Lanigan and there's no locks on the door? You know, and all the things that come in your mind is processing this is if you're up in the front of the room, 
I don't know what the students were initially thinking. You know, they were probably just thinking about running. But in my head, I have to think about what's happening if this person came in from the back of the room, you know. Um, and so in the, similar to Buffalo, you know, uh, watching the news in Syracuse, people being afraid to go into the tops in, Buff in Syracuse. Yeah. You know, I, and potentially being afraid to go into Price Chopper here in Oswego of the potential that could happen, you know, but because we're so small, I think a lot of times we think it won't happen. Yeah. There's always that possibility that it can happen. And so it's trying not to like say, oh, it'll never happen here. Oh, that's somewhere else. You know, they're much bigger. We're, they're used to that. Syracuse, we're used to hearing about shootings. But it's, it's still not that far from us that it can impact us. And so I think to some extent that was, it's not as tangible for some people mm -hmm. because it didn't happen here. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah, even the idea that there's a space where folks are used, where shootings happen more often, I think we, in the same way, we'll say that it's not going to happen here. It's not going to happen to me. We kind of hold those realities at arm's length until somebody can, until we understand somebody's personal experience. You know, I know when I was, I think my first exposure to experience with folks who had had that type of experience was when I was teaching in the Bronx and it was years of, it was, you know, it would be like, I'd peel back a layer and hear about a thing. And then I'd peel back another layer and hear about it, you know, learn about a thing. And um, to get that full picture of, of a life, you know, where you're affected by that. And yeah, so how do we, I do want to tell folks that, um, and Renee, I think this came up in the bias committee meeting. Uh, we are working with counseling, the counseling center to do a healing service, I think on, um, May 31st, I think Mark Markel spearheading it and he's looking at times and maybe some resources to bring into that conversation. So um, sorry, not the quickest, but we've been talking about it since um, since it happened. So um, uh, any fears that you would take if you're, well, it's 2.53, so I don't think we get to unpack everything. <laughs> um, so I want to tell folks this. So um, we are doing a training, an intergroup dialogue training. Um, some institute folks will be in it. We're opening it, opening it up to faculty and staff. I'm pushing it out there through um, Mallory Bauer. Uh, we've been talking about um, folks who teach first year experience courses and signature courses. Um, I know, I don't know, I don't think we figured it all out yet, but I know that there are plans to do more of this work with the campus. Um, in the, I have a little bit more Shinneman funding and in the fall, I'll do a cohort of, of students um, and have them participate in training with, uh, again, with Interfaith Works. Um, so if you're interested, let me know, um, you know, just so I have it in the hopper, either for this iteration or the next. Um, if you have further questions, let me know. Um, oh, I want to acknowledge Michael, this great response to actually, Allison, I wasn't sure whether you were saying that, um, the term, this term, the term ghetto has come up in your conversations or just terms where you're like, I got to deal with this, but Michael, um, kind of gave a nice breakdown of the history of the term, which I think that is a part of a, you know, that that's a part of the response, you know, this, let's couch this in reality. Let's, let's look at this and the origin of it and why it's used. And because then when we're, our response to it, the impact is connected to that history, right? So thanks for that, Michael. Thanks, Michael. Um, I was just thinking in general of, of when you students use, you know, uh, slurs and, and phrases of that sort, but um, not necessarily just the one, but thank you. I'll, I'll read that momentarily. Yeah. But yeah, so yeah, it happens, right? Um, so thanks for that. Does anyone have any questions or thoughts before I, um, end five minutes late? <laughs> All 
All right. Well, thank so, you so much. Thank you, everyone. And thanks for coming for this conversation. And uh, look for information about the 31st and more information about dialogue. And let me know if there's anything we can support. And have a great um, have a great day. And rest of your week. <laughs>